Thank you, Roland. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and I would like to say, I found that was really enjoyable. And I just want to apologise in case you thought I was just doing my email. I was tweeting because there were some real nuggets in there. And those of you who know me know I tweet. So uh, if you see me on my phone, I am probably tweeting. Uh, my, my second thing I need to say is I love Ellie Dealey. She always gives me titles like this. And I have no idea what I'm meant to talk about generally. So I think, I think the premise is that it allows me to have a broad church of what I want to speak about. Uh, and, and I feel slightly bad after listening to Fran and her patient-centeredness that the patient really doesn't feature very much in my presentation. Um, so I, I'm feeling guilt-stricken at the start. But it does talk about the evidence. And I'm going to pick up on some of the things that Fran mentioned. Because I think we have a wealth of evidence. It may not be high-level evidence, but there is certainly some things. And there are some things that we have known for many, many years. Like if a patient has a venous leg ulcer, then the gold standard of treatment is to put some form of compression on. I also think that we're, we've got a lot of different guidelines. And Fran mentioned the Yuma document that summarizes those guidelines and I would recommend that to you but I'm not going to use the Yuma one because it's quite a long one I've picked a shorter version which was in wound repair and regeneration where they summarize the guidelines but what I'm also interested in and the thing that I liked about Ellie's title of these pills and potions and lotions and bandages is for the majority of our patients they don't fit the guidelines they don't fit the research and I've spoken to a few of you throughout the conference about what, what, what are our patients that are not in the research. So when you look at the high level research, when they do have good definitions and when they do have good inclusion and exclusion criteria, they're not your patients because your multi complex, different disease, different environment patients are automatically excluded because they have all those complexities that mean that if you put them in a randomized controlled trial, they'd mess the trial up and they'd have to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So in daily practice, you have to think constantly, what do I do when I haven't got a guideline? And that for most of us is the reality of daily practice. So I'm going to use this as my summary. So this is the uh, summary of those guidelines from wound repair and regeneration because this is a letter form. So it's much shorter than the Yuma document. The Yuma document's got a lot more in it, a lot more um, meat on the bone of these guidelines but this had a nice table so I thought I'd start with this and they've summarized as you can see one two three four five six seven seven different international guidelines including the Cochrane guidance down here wound healing societies the sign guidelines from Scotland so what they have done is taken every guideline on leg ulcer management gone through them and looked at key topics such as diagnosis and determined what each guideline says on what evidence they have for that. So I've just picked up small amounts of them and things that I think are relevant. So I'm guessing most of you aren't doing surgery in daily practice, so we're not going to talk about surgery. But as I did the debridement and desloughing workshop yesterday, I wanted to pick up on debridement. And if you look across the guidelines, there's actually very little consistency. So some of them say uh, we should be doing wound cleansing and removing necrotic and revitalized tissue. Others talk about the solutions, others talk about uh, whether there's evidence or not. And so if you come across from we should be doing cleansing, we should be using tap water or a non-irritant solution, right over to Cochrane, does it surprise you that Cochrane says there's no evidence and further research is needed? Or is that something you could virtually write in every Cochrane guideline that you've ever heard of? Um, and it goes down to talking about specifics of removing necrotic and devitalized tissue, but it actually does say there's some evidence, but it's limited. And as Fran said, that the absence of evidence doesn't mean absence of effect. It simply means that nobody's demonstrated that it's been done. And I always refer back, and I don't remember whoever told me this first, but it's the really common example. I think it came from the BMJ. Has anybody ever done a randomized controlled trial to demonstrate that you need a parachute if you jump out of a plane? <laughs> the answer is no. And I think in our field, some things feel so common sense. People don't do the research. It's almost, it's so blindingly obvious, why would I waste the time and the effort? You know, ethically, morally, is it right to use all that resource checking something that is just so sensible? Oh, sorry, and I missed the bottom line there. So the bottom line, and this unfortunately goes over two pages, talks about compression. 
And this was my starting point of do we have evidence. If you look across them, they all talk about use of compression. They all say compression is evidence-based. So one says high strength, one, a couple of them say multi-compression, then we go high pressure, then compression, and then Cochrane, always sitting on the fence, says compression increases the healing rates compared to no compression. And they feel that multi-component systems are the most effective. Dressings I haven't really picked up on because what you see is that in some, it's not even mentioned for leg ulcers. Now, I think that's a bit of an admission. So in Cochrane, there's nothing about <coughs> moist dressings. What it does pick up is on pentoxyphylin, and you'll see support, 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 effective adjunct. How many of you use pentoxyphylin? Never heard of it. One, hooray. Um, it's got information about diagnosis, and I think Kath's probably going to pick up on diagnosis, and I will briefly mention it in a minute. A skipping surgery and some of the things like sterotherapy, autologous grafting, and allergenic grafting, because again, I don't think those are routine practice. Do you see much of that happening on a daily basis in your patients? But it goes back again to debridement with larval therapy. So it's not in, it can be an alternative, it's insufficient, it's not discussed, there's no recommendation and not found. What you see is inconsistency. And these guidelines all purport to be evidence-based. So picking up on what Fran said about reviewing the evidence, each of these guideline groups talks about how they review the evidence. And whilst you might in the evidence review find that they say that the evidence is weak, what does that tell you about the evidence of how they gather their data? They, they're all looking at the same literature. Now, if you all look at the same literature using good criteria, surely you should all find the same thing. So they also talk about anti-infectives in terms of topical antibiotics. Um, and really, it's a bit, again, on the fence. So some say may be adequate. Some say they're against. Uh, some say not discussed, shouldn't be applied, should be used judiciously. And lo and behold, Cochrane, further research needed. Silver has slightly different things. I don't know, you know... Uh, how they come to these differences, not discussed, not recommended, not discussed, no benefits and no support for routine use. Yet we all know that the Cochrane Review looked at the trial which added silver in as a treatment for leg ulcers that weren't infected and they found it made no difference. Well, that's unsurprising because that's not really what it's, what it's designed for. They separate out iodine, and you can see here, there's real difference. Not discussed, not discussed, insufficient evidence supports Cadexiva and some evidence to su support it. Honey, again, has very little evidence. But we've gone back to a different form of compression, IPC. And what's interesting is that IPC seems to have a reasonable amount of evidence, but how many of you use intermittent compression? One, two, two people. But it's a really good alternative for people that it suits, yet we don't see it being used. And then we focus on other things like nutrition and negative pressure. Uh, negative pressure not really being used greatly in the leg ulcer field, but with the new forms of negative pressure, we're starting to see it come through. And then some of the newer things like electrical stimulation uh, and uh, plasma fractions that I think, again, are quite new. But I've picked this one out. This one has got the strongest evidence yet only one person said they used it. And most of you indicated you had no idea what it was. So what does that tell you about how we use guidelines? Does that tell me that you never read your leg ulcer guidelines? And why is that? Is it because they're not relevant to your practice? Or is it because with that guidance, they don't tell you about the patient side effects? And that if you put patients on this drug, many, many of them vomit and have diarrhea, which isn't great, is it? And if you think about all the other things you're trying to achieve, so that goal congruence Fran talked about, you are trying to improve these patients' nutrition, these patients' hydration. You're certainly trying to not get diarrhea inside their bandages, and that's how bad their diarrhea can be. So whilst we know that that is a really good thing for the patients that it works for, it's not commonly used in practice but maybe we should try it more because not every patient gets those side effects. So a couple of you said you use it. I'm presuming you use it with good results. Do you get many patients who are sick? So one or two. And you said you used it as well once. Good results or not? Yeah. So it's something that we don't think to use. 
But again, if you're adding a systemic drug in, you also need to think about how many other medications that patient's on and all the interactions of that, because our patients are under carrier bags full of medication. You know, you've all told me when we were doing the, the wound care workshops that you go and you open the cupboards and think, oh my goodness, why have they got the... Somebody said seven bottles of an emollient, seven pump bottles of an emollient. And that's not uncommon, is it? And if you think about what was in there, compression was the consistent thing. Whichever form of compression, we said, that is the recommendation. And my starting point is we've known this since Christine Moffat did her work in 1992. She fairly conclusively said, let's get some patients in compression. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Roland, for reminding me I've been around for 30 years. Um, but that's, you know, most of my wound care career, we have known that compression is the way forward. But I just want to show you this one paragraph from the recent guest paper that, that Kath, and, Kath was very involved in. And if you've not read the paper, it's really worth reading for looking at what happens. They examined the thin database looking at a cohort of a thousand patients with wounds and comparing them to a thousand without wounds to look at what happened to those patients to get really to get some health economics but to look at what was happening in practice and there's some really damning information there about what happens to patients and um, firstly there were lots of patients who didn't have a diagnosis and there were then patients who had a diagnosis but the diagnosis was leg ulcer now that could mean anything couldn't it there were others that said they got venous arterial or mixed leg ulcers, but there was a big cohort that just said leg ulcer. And within that cohort, what you can see, only 16% of them had had a Doppler. But of those that had them, only 81% had got compression. So you've only got 16% having Doppler and only 81% having compression. If you look at those that didn't have a Doppler, which is a much bigger number, 84%, you've still got almost half of them having compression, which still means more than half haven't. Now that could be that the Doppler didn't indicate compression, but I think that that's unlikely, that higher number. So the one thing that we do have both good RCT evidence, strong recommendation in the guidelines, and I think good evidential knowledge for is compression. Yet when we audit practice, that's not happening. Isn't that a little bit shocking? In fact, quite a lot shocking, not just a little bit shocking. And you can look at why it doesn't happen. And I've talked to various people about different things, and quite often compression comes up. And I was talking to somebody uh, about a piece of work they were doing the other day, and they told me they have rearranged the way they deliver service into nursing homes, and they've got gold standard uh, guidelines for community care, but they've done a silver standard for nursing homes. And I thought, I don't, what's the silver standard? How does that work? So, well, it's good enough because um, they can't rely on the nursing home staff to do the bandaging because it's too complicated. And they gave me this long history of how, you know, they've worked very hard with the nursing homes and they go and they educate all the staff and train them to bandage and they go back three months later and those staff have moved on. And I understand that because that's what happens, isn't it? That happens on wards and in community teams, people move. But I know in nursing and residential homes, it's a particular problem having very, very mobile staff. But I can do compression and I don't see leg ulcer patients very often. Because now, if you go around that exhibition, you don't have to use a four layer bandage with all sorts of specialist techniques of bandaging that you have to learn and practice. There are many, many other ways of achieving that that the patient can do themselves. So if a registered nurse is not able to follow the instructions that we would expect a patient to follow, I'm slightly concerned about that nurse's registration, aren't you? So that I think we have no excuse anymore for not applying compression, as long as the patient is willing. And then that's the other thing that you get as a reason for not doing it, the patient refused. But I think Fran illustrated beautifully how if you work with the patient, you can find a way or a compromise or something that leads to that. And I guess as most of you are here are really interested in the leg club methodology, that's one of the things that you seem to see far less than anybody else. And I think a lot of that is about the environment and the way you work with your patients, that your concordance with treatment plans is a lot better. And I suspect a lot of that is peer group support. They see other patients having their compression and getting benefits from their compression. Therefore, to them, it's, well, why wouldn't that work for me? Whereas for many of them is, I don't think that would work for me. Um, 
I also think we need to consider the language when we use. I have sat and heard many people say to a patient, now we're going to try compression on you. It will probably be uncomfortable to start with. That's just backwards, isn't it? That's like saying, I'm going to do this. You won't like it. You'll hate it. In fact, why bother? You know, we need to say to patients, we're going to do this on you. It will really help you. Be positive, use the right language, and then you're going to get more engagement from the start. But it also brings me around to what can you do if you can't compress? And there are some patients that you can't compress. It may be that they've got a rip-roaring cellulitis, and cellulitis is not a reason for exclusion compression, but it may be at that point in time it is incredibly painful. It may be that the patient, you, you're working on that relationship with them, and you, the minute they won't agree to it, but you've got to get them into that goal. And these are usually patients with the very big, very wet legs, aren't they? These are the patients with the legs that they come in. You can kind of feel your, your heart sinking in your chest and kind of going, this is going to be a long haul thing. And then once you get some resistance as well, it, it's hard. But you've got to manage them in the meantime. So until you get them into that gold standard of compression and you are achieving your goals, you need alternative treatment strategies. And these are the kind of things that I, I, I'm talking about. Um, can you see those? Would we be better with this light off? These are patients with circumferential legs. Uh, the patient on the left is a patient who uh, self-neglects, I think is the right phrase, isn't it? The hygiene is not great. You've got thick, crusted exudates and many, many other things on that leg. Uh, multiple different areas of wounding. You can see on this patient, it goes virtually from the, the plantar surface of the foot almost up to behind the knee. You can tell by that rolled edge how chronic that's been, wrapped right around the leg. They've all got large legs. So straight away, you know these wounds are very wet. They're probably quite odorous. Um, they are difficult to bandage. You'll notice most of them don't really have an ankle to speak of. We could try and get them to do ankle exercises, but they've got very limited flexibility and mobility in that joint. And what I see happening in practice is people try all sorts of things to soak the fluid up. They use some of the really great superabsorbent dressings, and we've got some good superabsorbent dressings. But the challenges are when you get to the big pieces and you're using them all, all, all around the leg, they become very heavy, they become very cold, and they can become very stiff. Now, is that very patient-centered? Is that good? So you can use the superabsorbent so you reduce the frequency of care, but the end outcome is not always what you want. We can do things like use wound contact layers and then use other things all over the top. Um, and I've been working with a couple of people at the minute looking at a, a thing that comes on a roll because actually that's much better for a leg, isn't it, if you can wrap it around a leg. And we were talking to them about why they needed this and they took me into clinic to show me a patient where they were using the biggest size of wound contact layer they got and it was taking two or three of them to hold them all in place whilst they then got the padding over it and then some kind of either sleeve or light bandage to hold it in place. And that in fact, what happens when you do that is even if two or three of you do it, sometimes some of the pieces slip and what you get is the surgery pad or whatever you put over the top sticking in and amongst the jigsaw. So is that a familiar? Yeah. yeah. These are the patients that are real challenges to us, aren't they? You know, so how many dressings come in a big enough size? Very few, very few. And is that good for the patient's quality of life that it's taking? You know, they were saying sometimes it takes us an hour or two hours to do this, both this patient's legs. Well, that's not good. It's not good in terms of nursing resource, but it's really not good for the patients because they get very despondent and very downhearted. Um, so I think we need some alternative solutions. Uh, we need to think about how we do that. The reality is, I couldn't find any evidence of what to do with these patients. Uh, and I was getting really cross. I thought, I'm going to do a literature search, and what words will I use? And I came up with a whole host of words around large ulcer, circumferential ulcer, larger than, you know, everything that I could think of implied a large wound. And I found a very, very consistent answer for large wound, negative pressure. But nothing that talked about large circumferential leg ulcers. Nothing, absolutely nothing. It, you would occasionally pick it up in the negative pressure ones where they'd said, and we had been trying everything known to man beforehand, and the only answer was to put negative pressure on it. And to me, that's a real challenge because I know every one of you 
Has, have you all got, if you've got one of those patients, just one, can you put your hand up so I can see how many of them there are? Right. Would you value some guidance? I'd really like somebody to say to me, when you get these patients, these are things that might work. Because no one patient's going to be the same as the last one. But I want to know what everybody else has tried and what worked and what didn't work and why it didn't work. And if I know why it didn't work, I can look at my patient and think, probably not that one. Let's start over here. And I do think it's something that we need to start sharing information about. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned Rome. One of my roles is I um, edit Wins UK. And, and one of the real joys of that is I get to judge the abstracts for Harrogate. I say joy. We had nearly 350 this year, so it was a lot of reading. But that's the kind of place where you should be sharing this. And I think people get very wary about, oh, people won't be interested in my one patient case study. A one patient case study on a complex wound is actually really useful. Please don't think we ignore them or dismiss them, because if you've managed that really challenging patient and done it successfully and done it for the benefit of the patient, I'm interested and everybody else is interested. So, um, I did it about putting this in, and before I came up, I've just said to Kath, I've put this in. Um, <laughs> how many of you still use potassium permanganate? Yeah. Uh, and I found this, this lovely picture. Uh, this is actually koi pond potassium permanganate. But I think that's quite important, because koi are very precious fish, aren't they? They're incredibly expensive. And it says it's suitable for putting in their pond water. So if it's okay for, for very expensive koi, I think that makes it reasonably okay for our patients. But it does say excellent bath treatment for ulcers, parasite, and infections, but I think that means on the fish. <laughs> um, and I'm grateful to my colleague Girish, who's a dermatologist, who I stole these slides from. He does know I've got them. But um, Potassium permanganate serves a purpose. I think it's all very, oh, that's old-fashioned, we shouldn't go down that road. But sometimes when you are faced with those very wet, leaky legs, a short introduction to potassium permanganate used appropriately does work. And you can see there has been some research. It's not the newest research. This is from 1995, looking at 45 venous ulcers uh, and culturing what they found in there. And what they see is percentage reduction in bacteria. So a uh, high percentage reduction is good. I know you always think reduction is down, but the high percentage reduction is good. You'll also see mentioned on there acetic acid. Anybody brave enough to say they're still using acetic acid? Yep, a few people still are. And for very specific things, it serves a purpose. It's not a daily practice. But I need to know what those very specific things are that it works for, so that when my patient fits that criteria, I can get it and use it. More research done here, again in the 1990s, uh, and I can remember when I was first at TVM, which was in the 90s, people trying really hard to find evidence that we shouldn't use potassium permanganate, and really what they came up with was a very small amount that said, do you know what, for the right patient, it's the right thing. The difficulties we have are, it's all a bit vague, so what they say to you is if you have the granules, you put this much in this much water, and we're not very good at that, uh, or that it should look this colour. Now, this colour is very individualized, isn't it? It's not the most objective of things. So um, it's much better if you have the permatabs and they tell you. There have been studies done much further back. So if you go back into the 80s, there's studies like these or the David Leeper studies in the rabbit ear chamber saying that all antiseptics are harmful. Read them. If you've never read them, go and read them. Look at the dilutions they use, look at the length of time they use, and look at what they say. And yes, this one says that all those iodine, acetic acid, hydrogen peroxide, and sodium hypochlorite were cytotoxic, but hydrogen peroxide isn't. So maybe it's not the worst of the bad guys out there. But also remember the context of that. That's an animal model. Uh, it's not a real patient. We do need to be careful. So this is an example of how not to use the permatabs. So this is a little boy with eczema, uh, and his mum put the tablet in the bath and then didn't wait long enough and sat him on it. So that's a good indication of why you need to be careful with potassium permanganate. Don't let them eat them either, that's not good. Um, very purple faces. So thinking about the evidence, thinking about where we are with these increasing clinical problems, and yesterday I talked a lot about biofilms and infection in wounds, 
is this something that we can do? Is it still relevant for wound healing? Well, I think it plays a place. You know, it has a place, and it has a place in those really complex wounds that we don't have a guideline for. So maybe we need some guidelines to go with it. Um, and if you look through the guidelines, you can see it says there's no evidence that we should be doing this. So I think it does have a place. It has benefit in some very wet, weepy legs, but it's short-term use only, and it will stay. But I want to look at the broader issues that I've discussed there. You know, we're talking about not delivering care that we know is good standard care. We're talking about we've got no guidance on what to do on the complex patients. Um, and the problem is we do have clear expectations. Apologies to Fran because I've gone to the simple complex venous leg ulcer uh, model. Um, you've all seen this, haven't you? You all know that that's what we're aiming for. So we have a guidance for what we should do. But do we achieve that in practice? How many of us measure that? And I know it was talked about a lot yesterday of measurements of wound healing. Do we know that's what we're achieving? And if we're achieving it, why we're not healing it? Do we do the basics? And yesterday I started talking about itchy legs and itchy skin. And some of that is about basic hygiene, isn't it? But how often does that patient get their legs washed? Does that feature in the guidelines? Not really because it's maybe a little bit too patient focused that we're maintaining social hygiene for that patient. And you know, this use of buckets and should we be using them or not, I've had trust tell me that it's because uh, it's a moving and handling issue. I understand that, but you know, people carry buckets at home. Do most of you mop your floors occasionally and things, and we manage perfectly well. Um, I found this from, oh, let's come off the bottom, Jackie Stephen Haynes, Leanne Atkin and Joy Tickle, who did some work at a variety of study days they were involved in, and they asked people in the audience about what the barriers are to delivering legal care. And it'll be no surprise to you that most of the clinicians, over a third of them, said it was time. Is that your biggest pressure? How do I get to do this? And when I was listening to Fran talking about how you know, they worked out those lovely timetables with those patients, I was kind of thinking... Wouldn't that be wonderful if you had that much time? But I guess the point is, you have to make the time, because if you engage the patient in the care, you save the time further down the line. Uh, and that's what we struggle to do sometimes. It's the same in life, isn't it? You know that if you stop doing that really irritating thing, that I forget to do things until the last minute, some of you probably know that, if I planned a bit more, I would save myself an awful lot of time and an awful lot of stress. The other thing that they talk about in there a lot is training needed. I'm sorry, there is wealth of training out there. There is so much training that you can access. Um, and then there's very risk of recurrence, resources, and all of those come into play. Uh, and I think we need to really look at those and think about truly do they apply or are they just what the things that we say all the time? And we need to think about why aren't we doing the basics? Because the things that stop the patient healing are not dressing A over dressing B. The things that stop your patients going on to healing with any kind of wound are these. That they didn't get an assessment. You know, it's not me saying that. Go to the guest paper. Go to other literature that's looked at whether patients are assessed. They're not getting a diagnosis. And if they don't get a diagnosis, how can you plan the appropriate care? How many patients are getting skin care? One of my workshops yesterday, a lady said, my patient had their legs washed for two years. Two years to not have their legs washed. And why aren't patients being compressed? I'll refer you back to that data from guests. And I think we, we are focusing on the wrong things. We get so hooked up on that compression is too difficult. Let, you know, let's go back a bit and, and work out what we need to do. We need to stop making excuses and look at what the actual barriers to our practice are. And I think we need to be a bit more strategic. And I've been doing some, some work recently around these documents. Now, at this point, I can feel you all going like, I don't read things like that. How many of you read the sustainability and transformation plans? Lovely white paper from the government following on the, from the five-year forward view. I apologize to the people from Wales. This is NHS England. Uh, anybody read the Carter Report? No, you're going like, why? They've all got executive summaries. They're two pages long. They are worth looking at, because if you are struggling for resources, if you're struggling to get education, you need to start using the right language, the right current words. Alistair gave you lots of definitions yesterday, didn't he? That lovely end of his speech in the lovely management speak. But unless we use the language, we're not going to get there. 
But what is key in those documents is we must reduce variation. We used to talk about postcode lottery, didn't we? But everything now is about variation. Patients should not have differences in the care depending on where they live. And the Carter Report in particular says if there are areas of good practice, like the leg clubs, other people should take that on board. They shouldn't keep trying ways of finding things, of doing it and failing. They should say, they're doing it well, let's do what they're doing. And that's a real challenge. So this is um, from the sustainability and transformation plans. Sustainability and transformation is an electronic document. It is massive. It's got a, a list of something like 14 tabs down the side of things that are part of it. And every one of those has a document behind it and tools and all sorts of things. But it's worth looking at the executive summary and it's worth looking for really good diagrams like this, which really help you to engage management teams. And I think in this one, so this is about maximising the value, and they all talk about value now, not cost. We've got indicative data. You know, we know from the guest paper what's happening. There are also lots of atlases of variation. So if you're trying to be specific about your area, it'll tell you really specifically how many of your population are uh, obese or how many of your population have amputations and how you compare to the rest of the country. We've got evidential data. Somebody has reviewed the guidelines for us and told us what all the guidelines say. So we've got the case for change. What we need to do next is be a bit more savvy, be a bit more strategic and start saying to people, we need some clinical leadership and engagement to take it forward and make this a priority. And I'm very pleased to see that in some areas, although press ulcers are my passion, we're starting to now see leg ulcers coming in as sequence targets. So there will be targets set around legal care. And just the last document I want to draw your attention to is any of you seen this leading change adding value? Yeah, from Jane Cummings. I'm really impressed. Some people are nodding. This is the framework for nursing and midwifery. So I was more likely that you'd seen it. Um, have you also, also seen the review of district nursing by King's Fund? Yeah. That's no surprise, is it? It says you're overworked and burnt out. <laughs> um, but I think... The language in this is really good because it focuses on the things that we've been saying for ages. Patients should have better outcomes. But I like the second one. There should be a better experience for patients and staff. They are starting to acknowledge that nurses being burnt out, nurses working extra shifts, 12-hour shifts, taking work home with them, is not a way to have a well-motivated, evidence-based, happy workforce. And a happy workforce delivers good outcomes. They're talking about health and well-being, and you'll notice they put that first before care and quality and funding, but they also talk about efficiency. And reminding us about the six C's, I find the six C's depressing. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but as an older nurse, I find it really depressing that we have to tell nurses that being caring and compassionate is a key component of what you should be doing. If you haven't read uh, Leading Change, Adding Value, don't worry, there's a YouTube video, it's six minutes. Uh, and you can put it on in the background and listen to what its key focus is and some examples whilst you're doing something else. And really to finalise, I, hopefully in that very kind of mishmashy title, I've taken you through some of what we've got guidance for, some of the challenges we have, and hopefully some of the strategic tools that you can start to think about that will take us forward. Because I think as a group, you are really passionate. You're really passionate about legal care and you're really passionate about your patients. And I think you have the will and you can make the changes. You just need the voice to do it. Thank you.